Hello, hello. I'm Nancy Gardner. So glad you could join me today. Today we are going to talk about a topic that is absolutely essential to our success in real estate and to our being able to do the job we've been hired to do, and that is pricing. The first thing I want you to understand is that knowing how to price real estate well is our best insurance, again, that we can do the job we have been hired to do. It's that simple. The old thinking of just get the listing and eventually it'll sell after God knows how many price reductions is over. It's been dead and gone, but too many people in our industry still cling to it. We all move faster today. Things are available to us almost instantaneously or certainly within one day if we're willing to pay for it and and too many of us still think that months and months on the market is somehow acceptable you know we've we've updated our thinking on acceptable time frames and that needle keeps moving it's important that we you know are sure that our thinking, not just about adding more technology, but about acceptable time frames in which to do our job moves to. You know, when you think about it, what in the world ever made us think that six months or more on the market was somehow reasonable? It's almost laughable in today's terms, and yet in too many markets, even today, listings are sitting there. And agents are still telling their sellers, it's a seller's market at six months. Come on, people. We have to do better than this. Okay? Today, three to four months maximum is the point we move from seller to buyer's market and reverse, buyer to seller's market. And really, when you think about it, even that seems like a long time. Now, in some of your markets, that length of time on the market is unheard of. You know, it would be a sure sign that an agent didn't know how to do their job. So I do want you to consider the current pace of your market and what's relevant in, again, your market. Not nationally, your market. Now, there's another very important reason that pricing skill is important, not just to the client, but also to you. And that's the fact that not only does pricing affect your ability to sell a property, it affects your future ability to get hired because your results are how you are measured now. And your production data can be found everywhere you can think of and then some. Remember, $1.5 billion, that's billion with a B, was spent in our industry last year, 2017, on technology, all right? And a lot of it's going to be used for data, metrics, through MLSs, through back office kinds of things. And some of it's going to be wonderful as long as we step up. But the other part of it is, you know, what I've been talking about for years and years is everything about us is going to be online. We can take privacy out of the dictionary. I think it should have been taken out a long time ago or maybe described as something that we used to have. But your production data, okay, is going to be available to anybody that wants to take a look at it. So, in short, you are measured by your ability to get results for your clients. Now, here's the metrics that, are gonna, that they're looking for. These are the ones that are going to matter. First off, they look in the past 12 months, all right? They don't want a history. They don't need it. Some people used to do a lot more business years ago than they do today. They want to know that, so they want 12 months. So what they're looking for is the amount of business you've closed, both in volume and in number of transactions, okay? They want your percentage of listings taken versus listings sold. For example, if you took 20 listings in the past 12 months and you sold 16 of them, that's an 80% listing sold to listings taken ratio. Right, that's what they're looking for. Now, sitting there with that alone is not going to give them a perspective on your abilities. You want to compare that to what's the average percentage of listings sold in your market, and you get that out of the MLS. 
okay? If the market only sells 64% of the listings that it takes and you sell 80%, you see now how you stand out, how you uh, come across as the more skilled professional, the one that gets results. That's what they're looking for. In addition to that, they want to they wanna know your average days on market. Again, compare it to the market average. And then this last one is one sellers absolutely love, and that's that ratio between the original list price. I said original, not after price reductions. Original list price and the actual sales price. Sellers love it because it tells them you know what you're talking about, that they should take your pricing advice. Understand that's how they're looking at all of this. And I probably should remind you, while we're talking about everything being online about you, 94% of buyers and sellers were online the last two years before they ever thought about contacting us. Okay? And they're looking at your production data and they're looking at your reviews. Now, again, 70% of that 94% are people in your sphere of influence. Turns out they know more than one real estate agent and they want to hire somebody who gets results. Imagine that. They're no longer willing to pay thousands of dollars because they know you. Turns out what the new consumer looks for is a combination of production results and reviews. Make sure you are positioned that way. Everywhere they find you, they can find all of that information. All right. Now, let's look at the pricing vehicle that will help you and your clients. And it's important that you recognize that there are three levels to mastering this way of pricing. And oh, by the way, sellers love that you're an agent that uses and understands absorption rate analysis. And the other benefit is they also understand it. Because when you're just comparing their house, the way we used to do a narrow CMA between them and three or four other houses in their in their area that have the same floor plan, they can find all kinds of reasons to object to that. But when you compare their house to all of the competition that they're up against, they get that. They have a different perspective now. You want to understand how absorption rate analysis, again, helps them, helps you. So the three levels. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into all of them individually, but just as an overview, the first level is doing the analysis and completing the report, okay? In writing, the analysis is following the formulas on the worksheet, following the math. That's all you have to do. Don't, don't get out ahead of it. Follow what it says. Second level, being able to deliver the message. And this is one of the things I found over the years. When I first started teaching absorption rate, I don't know, it was 2007 or 2008, and I really used to just teach the analysis, you know, pulling the data and f filling out, you know, the report. And what I learned over the years is that that wasn't enough. Too many agents stopped short. They, that's all they were able to do. They didn't know how to deliver the message. Sometimes over the last 10 years, I mean, think about how difficult that message was. We had so much inventory and prices were sinking. And so it was a tough message. And so being able to deliver that message, critical to them hearing you, critical to you being effective with this type of pricing. And then the third level is handle, handling seller objections. And that's, it's normal. You know, because we are a relationship-based industry, too many of us still think that when somebody has a question about what we're telling them, what we're showing them, somehow they disagree with it or they don't like us or whatever, nothing could be further from the truth. You're dealing with an educated consumer. They do a lot of research. Don't expect them to understand what you are trying to put in front of them. They don't have your level of experience and expertise. So get beyond that, and please don't take it personally. The new consumer is a result of the recession. It has little or nothing to do with you. 
other than the fact that we have to understand it and we have to learn to work with it. It's not about you. It's about them. Okay. So now I can't believe I'm dealing with this next slide here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover it anyway. What does not affect pricing? Get beyond this. If any of you are still stuck on this, you need to move out of it. Obviously, tax assessments have nothing to do with pricing. Appraisals have nothing to do with pricing. Insurance values have nothing to do with pricing. What a seller has in it has nothing to do with pricing. What sellers put into a property is for their own enjoyment, their taste, their preferences. It's, it's crazy to expect a buyer to come in and have exactly the same priorities that that seller had. I mean, sometimes things, you know, can add value like a, an updated kitchen or bathroom and all of that. But when you walk into a house that's been, you know, decorated by a designer, well, sometimes that can be, you know, gorgeous and sometimes it can be pretty outlandish. And to think that somebody's going to have the same taste doesn't work. Um couple of others I want to throw in here while I'm thinking about it. It's also not what the Zestimant says. Can I just say that? And those of you that deal with that because the seller looks at it, and they do because they love Zillow, please take them down to the bottom of that page where it shows you can go into the Zestimant, and it will show the percentage that the Zestimant has been historically off in their area. Now, Zillow's getting better but they're not there yet. So use it. It's Zillow's own words. It's their own analysis. Use it if you're up against that. And the last thing is what a seller needs out of it. You know, we are all enjoying stronger markets. Some of you have been in great market territory for several years. Some of you just the last couple of years. There, believe it or not, okay, there are sellers out there that are still underwater. Be careful here, all right? Make sure what you're dealing with. There is a big difference in handling of objection, something the seller just still hasn't accepted or understood about pricing and handling a condition. For example, the seller's still underwater. They, you know, they owe more than the house will bring. It does still exist. The first one needs more convincing, needs more, you know, use the data. And the second, well, unless you plan to lend them the money, you cannot do the job. All right? And so be careful here. It's still out there. Be sure you're asking the necessary questions. The last thing you want to do is misrepresent that you can – market and sell a property and you can't because unless the seller can bring the money to the table and I would verify that this is both of your necks on the line okay you don't take the listing the best advice is for them to talk to their lender and see what's available to help them all right now let's get into this okay so what's the basis for absorption rate pricing and and how is it different from just that narrow CMA that we've done for decades, okay? Well, absorption rate pricing is based on all the available inventory that would be competition for that property, all right? And the reason this is necessary is because today's buyers change. They have so much more information. And again, they do a ton of research, okay? Some of them are better prepared than we are. And so they consider the deal still matters, all right, similar properties in similar areas. You know, roughly the same amenities. Not exact, roughly. Roughly the same commute. You know, some things that might matter, again, depending on your market, you have to know your market there. School districts can matter, uh, access to recreation, uh, local highlights and areas of interest. That can matter in a particular market. You know, what is, what is the subject property close to? You know, people, a lot of people like being around a lot of things that are close to them so they can easily get to them. And then the last part is economic conditions, all right? Now, 
right now I do these things in real time so that you have real information and we've seen a lot of volatility in the stock market lately remember the stock market is separate from the economy it's hard to fact factor that in but it's true and our economic foundation right now is still really strong we're in full employment wages are going up all of that now but what what the stock market volatility can do is it can affect consumer confidence and that's what you want to watch because consumer confidence right now is at the highest level in this century all right and it has a huge impact I mean we weren't even measuring it during the recession because nobody had any confidence in anything but it's back uh, you know, look at your chamber, local chamber of commerce. They should have that measured for you there. All right, so you know what it is locally, and it's the local. It's your region that matters. Nationally, that that's one measure, but does it really affect buying and selling real estate where you live, where you do business? So that's what you want to watch is consumer confidence. Okay, let's get down to this. Again, let's look at level one. All right, first thing we have to do screw your head on right people okay think like today's buyer you know what's important to them what are they looking for why does that matter oh probably because they're the ones who buy the property or not all right think like them not like your seller not like a real estate think like the buyer now Use the report in written form. Putting something in writing carries a lot more weight than just a verbal explanation. And please give the, a copy to the seller. Let them follow it with you as you're explaining it. Also, plan to reanalyze the market every 30 days if you've had no offers. Could have missed something. Something may have changed. Everything moves faster than it used to. Lay out that possibility when you're at, you know, you're doing your pricing analysis for the seller. So if it should happen, you know, they're prepared for it. It's not a shot to them. And then pull a comprehensive CMA. You do pull a CMA, all right, but you, you, you use one that's more inclusive. You cover all the relevant areas, includes all the properties that the subject property will have to compete against. Now let me give you an example of an area in Northern Virginia. We have a lot of close-in neighborhoods that have very different and distinct housing, which is, you know, can be difficult to get a handle on. But when you get further out into, you know, Fairfax County, Montgomery County, all the rest of them, we have a lot of subdivisions. And these subdivisions are huge. And they're, you know, it could be one, 2,000 houses. They may have golf courses and pool and tennis, and you know all that. Okay. So let's take that example of these big subdivisions. If somebody in, let's say, the Dominion Valley subdivision was putting their house on the market and the agent only compared that property to houses in Dominion Valley, the seller would not realize how much competition they have because if you're looking in Dominion Valley, you're looking in Piedmont. You're looking in villages. Same schools, same uh, neighborhood amenities, you know, roughly same, you know, age of housing, all of that. So you, right there you can see you have to be more inclusive. And remember, when you're presenting it that way, when they see, okay, that there are all these other houses out there similar to theirs, it really helps them understand what they're up against, what the competition really means, rather than four or five houses around them that they know and they've got plenty of reason why their house is worth more than those individual properties. Don't go there. Now, some of you, again, are not in neighborhoods like this. You have more individual approach to inventory because of when it was built, because of infill, all of that. Some neighbor, some areas still price per square foot, or it's a price point you need to study. But show the competition. Now, let's follow the worksheet. Don't get out ahead of yourself. Don't start, start hyperventilating. Follow the worksheet. Do one, do the next, do the next, do the next. Okay, you pulled an inclusive CMA, 
all right? You've got all the information for the areas that are relevant for the housing stock that's relevant to selling that property. So here's what you're going to pull following the form. This is not difficult. Don't make it tougher than it is. You want to know total number of active listings. You want to know, again, line by line, active listings days on market. Okay? Total number of listings pending and sold. Only count them once. Yeah, they're either pending or sold, not both. And the days on market for pending and sold. You see the reference this is giving you? Total number of canceled, expired, and withdrawn. And also canceled, expired, withdrawn days on market. Now, you won't use that on the report, the cancel and expires, but what you will do is be able to handle seller objections with it because those are the price ranges that didn't sell. And look, Mr. Seller, look how long they were on the market. You see how you use this? You also want to know the percentage of fall through, okay, because in some areas, fall through has come back with a vengeance. Most of it seems to have to do with, with home inspections gone bad, uh, which is why I recommend a pre-list home inspection. But be that as it may, if you've got fall through over 10% and people say, well, Nance, how do I figure it out? Some MLSs are up to date and give you good data. If not, look at what's happening in your office or your company. It's pretty representative, okay? And, and use it. If it's 20%, then we've got to subtract that from the pendings and the sales, because all those pendings didn't won't sell. Fall through is too high. And then the last one I want to talk to you about is a leading indicator. And people have really asked me about this lately. Um, I think out of fear that their markets might be changing or will change or can't continue like this or whatever it is. But a leading indicator is something that's happening in real time. All right? It's not something that you have historical data on because it's happening right now. All of a sudden, phone's not ringing, nobody's at open houses, nothing's going under contract, listings are sitting, and you can feel it. It's palatable. But again, you don't have history on it happening right now. That happened, for example, in some area, in coastal areas um, late last summer and early fall because of the hurricane season they experienced. Even in coastal areas that weren't directly hit, people kind of went, wait a minute, i got to see if this place is going to blow away before I buy here. Now, it only happened in September. October, we came roaring back. However, when you're going through it, you don't know that. You know, we don't know if we're going to have a Katrina on our hands where it has a huge effect. We, we, don't, we don't know that. We don't have that crystal ball. All we can do is factor it in and explain it to the seller and say, I don't have data on it yet. I'm watching it for you. And if it becomes a factor, then we'll factor it in when we, when, if I have to do another absorption rate analysis because you've had no offers. That's how you do. You explain. And please, gang, explain all this. Don't just pass over it. Don't think they know what all of it means because you do. They don't. Just because people live in houses doesn't mean they understand what we understand. Thank God for that because they wouldn't need to hire us if they did. So after you've pulled all of this information, just do the math right there on the worksheet. Do the math. Your pending listings plus your sole listings will give you Total sold listings. Remember, make sure you're only counting properties once. All right? So fill out the form. Let's have an example. Okay, they were, I'm going to use easy math here. Okay, so let's say you found 10 pendings in those geographic areas you studied, in the price ranges that you studied, and 10 sold listings equal 20 total sold listings. Now, I'm looking for a monthly average. So I'm going to divide that total sold in this example. We said 20 by two months. Why two months? Because you want current market information. Remember, we move faster now. What happened six months ago is not relevant unless you had no, had no market activity on that type of a property in the last six months, in which case you go back six months and you divide the total sold by six instead of two. 
But in this example, again, I'm using easy math. If I divide the 20 total sold listings by two months, the average number of homes selling per month is 10 in the price ranges and the geographic areas you studied. Okay? Now, don't worry. You're don't, not going to have to put in price ranges when you do that CMA. They're going to come up. You're going to put in your parameters that a buyer would put in in terms of amenities, commute, uh, square footage, you know, all of those things. And the price ranges will pop up. And they could be 249 to 279 or 859 to, you know, uh, 889 or a million one to a million four. It'll take care of itself. Let it take care of itself. Okay. So once we've pulled all the data, once we've done the math on our little worksheet, now we're going to complete the written report. And I'm going to have to keep saying written here because too many of you try to just explain this and you fall flat. You wonder why it doesn't have the effect. And let me also say, again, a lot of people teach absorption rate pricing wrong incorrectly. A lot of agents use absorption rate only to say, oh, we have four months of inventory in our market. Well, that may be a true statement for your county or your town or however you're measuring it. But we need now, we're doing a more specific analysis on that type of property. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you're pricing. Another thing that's commonly taught is you go back 12 months for your analysis. No, that's not relevant today. Most of your markets are not where they were 12 months ago. And 12 months out, they won't be where they are now. So you're giving them incorrect information. Remember what I said, things move more quickly. We have to be current. It's important. Okay, now I know this sounds silly, but please put the date and the property address on this report. Especially if you do more than one, we want, and, and let's say you got out early. Let's say you got a call and they wanted to have an idea late last fall of what their property's worth. So you went out, you did the, you, you did the analysis, you showed them, and they said, okay, we want to put it on the market the 1st of March. All right? Well, from the end of October to the 1st of March, your numbers probably won't look the same. You're going to have to redo it. And you want to be able to point to that date and say that. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that was four or five months ago. I need to give you an updated analysis so that we're sure you're positioned correctly with today's market. Again, list all the geographic areas you included and explain why you included them. Don't expect them to agree with it. They don't understand what buyers are looking for. They don't have the knowledge you have. Explain it. I really believe we get in, we miss a lot because we don't explain enough. We, we assume they understand it or they know or whatever, and, and we lose out because of that. Then you're going to show them the price ranges for their competition. Okay, it could be, you know, 459 to 489. It could be, you know, it could be all over the place. Whatever your price ranges are, again, for similar properties. That's what they're up against, okay? So then you show them the number of active listings. Let's say, for example, in these geographic areas and then this price ranges, and these are the price ranges for houses very similar to yours. No, they're not an exact match, but they are close for, enough for today's buyer. You show them the price ranges, the active listings. So let's say there were 30, all right? Then we computed the months of available inventory, and we had, and so that's I mean, and, and the absorption rate that's ten that's um, three months of inventory. So if I have three months of inventory, how am I going to advise pricing? Remember how we read the market. If you have, I say you know less than three months and, and in some markets it's less than one month you really have to know the speed of your market there okay then you you may be at the top of that pricing range because there's little or no inventory the more months of inventory you have and if you still have a ton in some areas around you you've got to get underneath to attract today's buyer you've got to make that house really stand out 
If you've got months and months of inventory, pricing more than anything will make that property stand out. And then, become, and then comes condition and location and all of that. But understand that's how that works. Upper end of the pricing spectrum, when you have little or no inventory, down lower or below it, when you have a lot of inventory. That's how you advise pricing. That's how you compute the market price. Okay? All right. Now, again, I want to make this point. We've got to get this. Moving from a seller to a buyer's or a buyer to a seller's market, please rethink your time frame. Again, three to four months for the change from one to the other, that's ludicrous in some of your markets. Ludicrous. Because you don't have the inventory to support it. But there's still some agents thinking, oh, no, it's six months to change from one to the other. That's crazy. You're going to get laughed at. Okay, update your thinking. This is all subject to your market conditions. And remember what the Wall Street Journal termed it. He said, the, the, the article in the journal, and this was probably about two years ago now, they said buyers have a term for listings that sit on the market, and it's called stale listings. And they won't, most of them won't even bother to look at them because they figure there's something wrong with the property or Seller's not motivated, you know, and if they do come in, they, they're thinking deal. I'm going to get the deal of the century. And that's how you've positioned your seller. So explain these things. They don't know this. It's not their job. That's what they're hiring you for. So make sure you're covering all of this, okay? You know, and remember, your position is strengthened by – your ability to use data. So when we present, which is at level two, in order to present with confidence, please, please, please hear me on this. Use data, not opinions. Your opinion may be technically right, but because you haven't put data in there, in the mix, they're not listening to you. They don't listen to opinions anymore. They listen to data. It's the number one thing they value. And if you don't know how to use it, well, practice, practice, practice. Those of you that are in companies that I work with, hopefully you're using simulation training, which is an upgraded form of role play. It's where you actually use situational training so that people have agents have the benefit of practice before they go out in the field, you know, we get to make all our mistakes in-house and laugh at each other and, you know, learn from it and go on so that we don't get out in the field and that happens to us. If you don't have that, practice in your car, okay? Don't drive off the road, memorize what you're saying and then and practice because in the car you can hear yourself. The, the, the acoustics in a car are pretty amazing. So, again, people have more faith in data. Use it. It's not an, a slight. There's no offense meant. It's how they operate today. Okay. Now, let's go to level three. This is where we get to handle the seller objections. Once again, gang, use the numbers. You know, it's, it's so much easier if you master the numbers. We used to be sitting out there on a limb. Well, I think, or, you know, I think you ought to do this. You know, we didn't have all this to back us up. That's the great thing about data. You now have backup. You're not out there, you know, on thin ice. You can rely on other things, but only if you use it. Use the numbers. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, the price point you're looking at, if I, I pulled all the cancel expireds and withdrawns, they were in the same price point. Their average days on market was this, and ultimately – they never sold. And then, again, don't forget their questions you can ask. Now, remember, asking questions takes skill, not only knowing what question to ask, but asking it in a gentle way. Not defensive, not sarcastic. You may be thinking that, but don't do it. You know, could you explain to me how you arrived at your price point? Then you know what, to, what objections to handle. Well, what part of my research is unclear to you? 
find out where they got lost in the weeds. I mean, for gosh sakes, you can think about how long it took you to understand all this stuff. Don't expect them to get it in one sitting because it does take a while to grasp this. I had one office that I worked with, and boy, when they learned this, first time I was in there was 2007. And their market, they were coastal market, they were in the doldrums, and they didn't know what to do. And the first thing I taught them was absorption rate. That broker jumped on it. She sent letters out to her, every seller in that market, that, and said, Our, my, your agent will be calling you to discuss an up-to-date pricing analysis on your property. They got extraordinary numbers of their listings reduced. Now they had something to go on. And sellers understood it because they saw, oh, my God, look how many houses are on the market. And they became the number one office on the market. And for as long as she had that brokerage, she sold it. They were the number one office in that coastal market because they knew how to price. And sellers would listen to them because they presented the full scenario of how much competition they had. Okay? So use the numbers. They're your, be they're your new best friend. Okay? Now, I added something to this webinar just in case you might need it. Okay? Call me psychic here, but I think this is relevant. Um, and that's how to go about getting price reductions. Because all of you aren't where you need to be on pricing yet, and I want to give you a format. And, you know, I swear, I don't think the whole time I was an agent, anybody ever taught me this. You know, people told me, go get a price reduction. Go get a price. But they never said, how do you do it? Well, I'm going to I'm gonna fix that for you, okay? So, first off, all right, and again, I hope that you're fully skilled with the absorption rate analysis, and you get an offer in the first 30 days or less, and you don't need this. But just in case you have some inventory sitting around, or you're not as skilled as you hope to be with it, let's look at this. Well, on listings, again, how do you pull this? On any listing inventory, in some markets, it's two weeks. In some, it's 30 days. In some, it's 60 days. But the outside time on market is 60 days. So if you're over this with any of your listing, you grab those first and redo or do, if you haven't done it before, an absorption rate analysis on each of those listings. We're going to deal with each of your listings individually. That's very important. Okay? And the proper format for you to use to get price reduction is sitting right here in front of you. And I've given you a handout for it, so you have it. First off, we have to requalify the seller's motivation. Okay, hopefully you know what that is. If you did proper preparation, you ask what their motivation was to sell. If you didn't, well, there's no time like the present, so ask it now. Because you got to know it. One of the things, when I was a broker and agents would come in with issues and problems and deals that were going crazy, first thing out of my mouth was, what's the seller's motivation? What's the buyer's motivation? Motivation determines Almost everything. Don't overlook that. It's a normal question to ask. And if you haven't asked it, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, could you tell me why you wanted to sell the, your home or this property? Whatever it is. Okay, now you at least know it if you didn't know it in the past. Then, again, ask for the reduction using the new absorption rate analysis. Given that you've been on the market X number of days and the average days on market for available inventory that you're competing against is this, this is where the market, not you, please don't tell them your price, it's all market price. This is the price that the market is showing me right now. This is where you need to be in order to attract today's buyer. From that you may still get some objections sometimes. Guys, objections aren't personal. That's all a part of them. It's what they don't understand. It's what they, you know, can't accept. And remember, earlier in the webinar, I told you how to separate objections from conditions. And hopefully, at this point, you're not dealing with any conditions. 
if you do, better find out about them now than, than never, okay? So handle them. Use the numbers. Use the numbers. Again, go back. Ask for another reduction. Again, if you don't get it, you've got a choice. If you get the reduction, outstanding. Even if you only get half your listings reduced, you're on the road to selling those listings for your clients. And oh, by the way, need I mention you're, you're going to get paid. Um, but if you don't get the reduction, you really are going to have to make a business decision. And you're going to have to make that business decision on whether or not it's in anybody's best interest, the seller's or yours, to keep that listing or to terminate it. And the reason for that, again, is because your ability to get results for your clients is what other people online, your sphere of influence, are looking at to decide whether or not they're going to contact you for future business. And the great thing when I'm, agents are telling me, they say, Nance, you know, I really do take it into consideration now. I realize that I'm going to be measured this way. Yeah, and, they, and they're right. Nobody's, you, you're not going to get the opportunity to say, oh, well, my seller was difficult or, oh, he was unrealistic. They don't care. They don't care. They care that you're able to do the job. So you may have a tough decision here. Now, I will say this. This is pretty interesting. Agents sometimes will tell me that when they've made the decision to give this listing back to the seller, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, based on, you know, your insistence on this price and the market analysis just is, can't support this, uh, I'm going to return your listing to you because I can't do the job you've hired me to do, and I'm not going to lie to you about that. Now, if you change your mind and you want to be competitive in your pricing, I'd be happy to work with you and get this property sold. But right now, you've tied my hands. What happens when agents say, they say, I, I gave them back the listing, and the sellers responded with, you're really serious, aren't you? And the agent said, yes, you've hired me to do a job. So I'm going to be measured by you on my ability to do the job, get you what you want in terms, in, in, in terms of selling this property so you can get on with the rest of your life. But I'm also going to be measured by other people thinking to hire me. And they're saying I can't get any get results. I can't do, I won't do that anymore. Not I can't, I won't. And then the sellers will, will acquiesce to the recommended price, to the price the market is showing. It's been pretty interesting. It's as if they, you know, thought that it was somehow some a sales ploy or something. And, you know, given how skeptical and mistrusting that we know consumers are today don't take it personally it's just where people are and you know it, it's it's just the mindset that we deal with we have it in our own right on certain things that we purchase so it's not about you it's about where they are and how they think so there's your price reduction format now you've got a way to price real estate you're going to have to learn it but I promise you, when it clicks, you're going to be better at pricing real estate than you ever thought possible. And your confidence will soar. But you're going to have to work at it. It doesn't just come, you know, because you want it. you got to work for it, all right? For any listings that you have left over, okay, or that didn't sell the first 30 days, certainly the, the 60 days, here's your price reduction format, okay? You've got tools to use now. And, and don't just sit here and go, okay, this is great. Guys, we've got to do the work. We're not going to survive this not doing the work. Don't underestimate what it's going to take to win this. That will be a huge failing. It's the same thing. What's happening in our industry, what everybody's talking about with discounters coming, becoming more and more prevalent, with online opportunities for buyers and sellers to come together without an agent. We're going to, we're going to have to take the same tack, the same strategy, that travel agents took. And there was an extraordinary article, I, could, I couldn't believe it, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago about how the travel agents succeeded when everything about booking travel was easily put online and easily accessed online. And what they said was they got better at what they did. 
They learned more about the destinations, more about the um, cultural highlights, more about how to get people at the front of a line at a museum, for example, what to do in emergencies, you know, all of this stuff. They got better. And those travel agents that did that, not only are they still around, they make more money than they've ever made. And I believe the same thing is going to happen to this industry. So please don't ignore this. If you want to be one of the professionals, and you will be seen as a professional, that's how good you'll be that survives this and makes more money than you thought possible, learn your trade. Make sure nobody's better at it than you are. Okay. And remember, regardless of market conditions, market conditions are our job. We, don't, we can't control them, but we can learn how to deal with them. And always keep in front of you, we must know more than our competition. We have to know your competition's production results. That's how you're going to compete. And guess what? All that information about you online, it's all about them too. So take a look at it if you know you're competing against them for a listing, for gosh sakes. Is it an agent that buys listings but doesn't sell them? Well, you got a lot you compete on. You don't compete on a personal level. You compete on somebody's ability to get result for the client. Any weak areas you have, and your numbers will point right to it, keep training it. Keep going back. You'll get it. And at last but certainly not least, continue to evolve around the new consumer. This is going to be everything. Remembering it is about them and not us. Okay, gang, it's been a, a pleasure to be with you today. I'm so grateful you could join me. You take good care out there. Keep on keeping on, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.